pretty face, which shows how desperate we are. Okay, uh, let's see, if you are looking for the Austin API Meetup, you found it, that's a good sign. Uh, if you want to keep up with us throughout the month, we are Austin API on Twitter. Uh, we try to tweet things that are relevant news articles, uh, relevant stories, relevant uh, whatever throughout the month. Uh, stay tuned there. Uh, we are also austinapi.com. So if you're trying to direct people to the Meetup group, it's really easy, austinapi.com. Doesn't get much easier than that. Uh, you guys all know where it is because you're here, so I take that as a good sign. Uh, let's see, a couple things I wanted to share about tonight. Who's going to OSCON in a couple weeks? Woohoo! All right, fantastic. Uh, so, a couple things with that. One, O'Reilly has sent me a pile of books. We'll be raffling those off at the end of the evening. I also have a free pass to the expo of OSCON. So if you want to go around and see the booths and all that sort of stuff that's going on, it's a free pass. It's like a $49 value. I've got a whole stack of them, so come up and grab one at the end. Also, thanks to Computer Associates, uh, we have a free bronze pass to OSCON that will be raffling off at the end of the night. Okay? Yes, thank you, Computer Associates back there. Uh, we'll hear from them at the end. Uh, let's see, some important things coming up other than OSCON in two weeks. Two weeks from tomorrow is Techstars Demo Day. So everyone, everyone know what Techstars is? Okay, a few people. Techstars is one of the top accelerators in the US, uh, actually in the world at this point. They've got places all over the place. Um, it's an accelerated program where you come in with an idea, sometimes a product or a prototype, sometimes with customers, and they help accelerate you. They don't get you started. It's not like an incubator, like the very beginnings. This is all about turning your project into a product and making money. So their demo day is coming up on the 19th. And I believe it's at the Paramount on Congress. Uh, so definitely check that out. Yes? Capital Factories Demo Day is tomorrow. Capital Factories Demo Day is tomorrow. And that is here? It's, this is actually the startup Longhorn camp that Josh runs. So it's almost always his. Oh, yeah. It's at uh, LBJ Library? LBJ Library. LBJ Library. So that's uh, Longhorn Startup Lab, I believe is what it's called. Yes. Uh, also, two weeks from this Friday, the Iron Yard, which is one of the code schools in the area, um, it is having its demo day at uh, on that Friday. I forget the, uh, the location offhand, but it's it's looking to be a great event. Um, if you're interested in joining a hackathon, ATX Hack for Change. So this is a social good hackathon. I'm one of the organizers, so I'm horribly biased. Um, it is all about. It is not about having a hackathon where on Sunday night you demo something and the project dies that evening. We are working with actual um, nonprofits starting about three months ago to help them scope and define their project so that when they come into the weekend, they're prepared to take it forward. So our metric is not how many projects demo on Sunday night. Our metric is how many projects are still alive six months later. So if you want, if you're like interested in, in nonprofits and social good stuff and you want to put your skills to good use, this is a great opportunity to do that, okay? If you work with a nonprofit already and they're interested in participating, let me know. Let them know. It's atxhackforchange.com, I believe. And every, oh, dot .org, I'm sorry. That would make sense. Yeah, .org. I say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely check it out. It's a great event. Uh, last year, Mayor Steve Adler was our opening keynote, so like it's legit from the city and everything like that. Uh, let's see. What other announcements do I have? Lots of announcements. May is a busy month around here. Um, oh, I run a Twitter account called ATX Tech Events. If you're interested in any of the tech stuff that goes on in Austin, that's a good way to keep involved. It monitors 230 different meetups, events, conferences, whatever, and tweets about them throughout the month. So definitely check that out. Uh, let's see, next presenters. In June, Tony Blank from SendGrid will be here. Uh, he will not only be buying the beer, he'll be giving a presentation. So a like double threat there. Uh, we are looking for a July presenter, if anybody's interested. Any takers right now? All right, what do you want to talk about? Um, I basically want to talk about uh, my uh, mobile architecture that exploits mobile service, uh, services on AWS via Lambda, and Micro, uh, and APIs. So in other words, I'm building a, a, a new app that moves all, all of my stuff from Parse to AWS, and I want to share my experience going into a microservices architecture around Lambda 
which is, I think, basically what you guys do. So this, this tonight will be about the how. This will be the end results. So if you believe James tonight and you're interested in what he does, you know, you can wait a couple months and listen to what the results will be, good or bad. Uh, let's see, also in October, we want to do a lightning talks session. So lightning talks are minimum of five minutes, maximum of 15. At 15 minutes, we cut you off, okay? <clears throat> Uh, looking for probably six to eight people. The themes are cool tools. Hey, you should know about this or something I learned. Okay? Should be related to APIs. So if you've got anything that fits in one of those three categories, cool tools, you should know about this or something I learned, please let me know and we'll share about that. We've got um, the Open Austin meetup that they do civic APIs that are interested in presenting and we have one that will be presenting also potentially, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see, I think that's all the announcements. We have a ton of giveaways at the end. O'Reilly sent me a pile of stuff. We've got the computer, computer associates, uh, bronze pass for OSCON, and quick calibration questions. Who are my developers in the room? All right, uh, QA, testing. One, all right, uh, documentation. Zero. Docs aren't important anyway, right? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, designers, UI, UX types, uh, ops, DevOps people. I'm trying to eliminate ops. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Over here. No, I'm a no ops guy. Although no ops guy. Okay, what roles am I missing? Product managers. Okay, a couple. Anybody else? Spectators. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, developers in the room, what languages do we work in? Uh, Java. C sharp. One. C sharp. Okay, PHP. Python. Uh, Go. Ruby. Uh, JavaScript. Oh, lots of JavaScript. Uh, let's see. Scala. Scala. Uh, closure. There's always one closure guy. I don't think he's here tonight. <laughs> I did it a little, like a month. What do you work in primarily? Uh, uh, Python. Python, okay, Python. cool. Uh, did I miss anyone else's favorite language? You forgot Ross. the best one, bb.net. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> we'll strike that from the recording, okay? Uh, any, other, any other languages I miss? Any other real languages I miss? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Rust. Rust. Yeah. All right. What is that? Uh, Kotlin or whatever. I just make stuff up here. I'm surprised you guys listen to me. Okay, cool. Any other questions before we get rolling? That's from the uh, tools guy, the Jeff Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Uh, tonight we've got my good friend, co-author, co-conspirator, uh, business partner at times, uh, James Higginbotham, is going to tell us about um, microservices and applying domain-driven design. Now. Let me give you a little caveat. He is giving this presentation in three weeks. Three weeks at GlueCon outside Denver. So if you have any feedback, suggestions, or whatever, please let him know. But you're getting a like an excellent presentation for free. So hey, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. So with that, James, please take it away. Thanks, Keith. All right. <clears throat> so I don't have to do the survey with languages or anything else now, which is great. All right. Who likes to build code that they get to throw away immediately? Oh, I'm totally there. Yeah? Totally there. Yeah. Research code is okay. the best. All right. We'll see if you like it by the end. All right. So as Keith said, uh, he and I have worked together quite a bit. We've been doing a lot of API training. Part of that API training is to help cross-functional teams understand how to design and execute uh, APIs through their digital transformation processes, if they're in the enterprise or within their software as a service or their API as a product that they're deploying out to a particular market. And part of what we do with that is to teach people how to think in APIs and then how to go through that process of designing an API that will last a long time. Okay? We know that APIs need to change over time, but we want to try to reduce the amount of thrash that we have, particularly up front when we're trying to onboard those first few customers. We don't want to have to change a lot of things on them too quickly. So a lot of the time that we spend is focused on how to uh, think about the problem space before we start writing code. I know a lot of us like to jump right into code, but sometimes taking a little bit of time and putting a little thought behind us can save us a lot of time later and a lot of pain on both our side and on the API consumer side that's going to be using our APIs. So I usually interact with teams uh, on a variety of different ways. Uh, I can help people build great APIs. I can help them do design 
coaching, we can do consulting around their product, as well as training. And one common thread that I have all the way through is great APIs, API design is critical to product adoption and for long-term success. Um, an example of this, how many of you strike? How many of you okay. strike in your application in some way? Yeah, okay, so a little bit fewer than I really would have expected, but that's all right. So Stripe is really interesting in that they are purely an API as a product. Instead of having to go to a, an API gateway and a payment processor to be able to accept credit cards, you can just sign up, drop in some JavaScript on a website, start accepting credit cards, or as a developer, you can integrate on the back end through their API. And they have a variety of different ways to be able to integrate with it. What they do is they really focus on telling a story about their API. Their API is sort of a byproduct of what they do. Their goal is really to be able to enable commerce across any kind of business of any size very easily, very quickly. Right? That's their story, that's what they take to market. And it just so happens that they're API powered. So great APIs really tell a story, and they tell a story not about themselves, but what they're enabling people to do. Now, part of what they've had to do over the uh, last several years is update their API design. They've had to make changes, they've learned more, had to make tweaks to different things, support different country currencies and other things as they've expanded out their, their feature set. Recently, uh, one of the originators of Stripe uh, was interviewed and it came out through this tweet from the person who's interviewing them that there's at least 50 different versions. He came back and actually clarified and said there's about 65 different versions of their API that they can currently maintain, okay? 65 is actually the number that they claim. That's a lot of API versions. And sometimes that kind of change is required when we get into building an API. For situations like this, would you push back to your consumers, oh, now we need to do slash V66, <laughs> right? But that's what a lot of the community is saying about versioning APIs, right? Yeah. So we want to do a good job of designing our API up front, and when we make those changes, I really encourage API providers to consider who should own the versioning, you or the consumer. Stripe's made a decision that they, as the provider, are going to own the versioning. They're not going to force the consumers to have to upgrade their code, because once they get it up and running on their site, many of these smaller businesses that probably don't even have full-time staff developers, they're never gonna change that code. So we have to make sure that we build that thought process in when we're going through API design. So it's a little bit of a side note, but this is me getting on the soapbox saying, if you're building an API, consider owning the versioning rules. Yeah. So, but Stripe is interesting because they are about payments. And payments is an extremely mature industry mm -hmm. with extremely mature business patterns. Yes. So they can support those different APIs forever because the underlying process actually isn't changing for the people who use the older APIs. That's true. That is very true. Um, one thing to remember though is if you release an API and say that someone is, is paying to use your API, pulling, out, pulling the rug out from under them is a big mistake at times, right? It, there can be a huge amount of pushback from the community if you start pulling features away. So obviously with payments, it's pretty straightforward. For other vendors, sometimes they release a feature, they try it out and say, well, I didn't really get any traction, and they start pulling it back, and they pull it back really quickly, so like too quick at times. So we do have to be careful about that. Well, the, the other way that that's handled, at least in my enterprise experience, was always about advertising things as provisional. And yeah. provisional advertisement <laughs> actually works reasonably well until you decide you don't want to offer that service anymore and people depend upon it. In other words, if you pivot, yeah. people get very upset because the provisional meant you were going to stay in that direction and pivoting is bad. Right. Anyway, sorry, I'm interrupting That's your call. That's all right. Did you ask? Can you give an example of how and when the consumer will own the versioning of the API? Uh, so when I say uh, consumer owning the versioning versus the server or the provider owning the versioning, when are we requiring the, the developers that are on the consumption side to have to change their code? So who's changing code when the version changes? If the provider changes it, then they're, they're, it's their responsibility to, it, to maintain the old version as they roll out new versions and be able to continue to support that old version. Yeah, good question. 
All right, so as I mentioned uh, with Stripe and with others, a your API design tells a story about who you are as a company, how you see the world, what you're trying to solve, how you want to see things moving forward in the future. It could be simple or it could be pretty complex. Capital One is a great example. They, at South by Southwest, anybody go to South by Southwest and see them, go to their, yeah. So they've released three APIs publicly right now, and they're doing a lot of interesting things. They have, they said, hundreds and, and maybe even, I think they said thousands of APIs if you count some of their older APIs as well, that they have internally, and they've started to move toward productizing some of those capabilities and externalizing that to developers. So they're telling a story about how banks can be interacted in a completely different way. And as a uh, merchant, you might be able to interact with them in a way that's much different than uh, indirectly through payment gateways, payment processors, and so on. So they're, they're getting a direct connection with, with uh, developers and with businesses. We have IBM Watson, right? IBM Watson doing a lot of machine learning, vision, speech recognition, all kinds of different insight APIs. They're telling a story about how computers can automate a lot of things for us and do things that previously they could never do. And then, of course, we have Marvel. Can't go, uh, go through a talk without having a Marvel API, right? So we have the Marvel API. This is an official API from them. There are some APIs for different, uh, different franchises. Some of them are maintained by third parties. But this is actually maintained by Marvel themselves. Gives you access to different comics, uh, characters, uh, stories, events, all kinds of different things. So every one of them is telling a story and interacting with a group of people with a community in some way and helping to solve a problem, even if it's something as fun as working with the Marvel API just for the fun of it. I know Keith actually did an SDK in PHP, right? Uh, so that you can, with a couple lines of PHP code, talk to the Marvel API. You can summon the Avengers with one line of code. <laughs> you just call it assemble. <laughs> Today is May the 4th. I know, and I would have loved to have put in something for Star Wars, except that uh, Disney has not released an official API. There's only third party maintainers on the side. Oh, I wanted to kind of keep it clean, no keep it pure here. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no rebel scum. Get <laughs> that right. The sixth is coming. Oh, gotcha. All right, so. What that really means is, no matter what we're trying to do, your API design is going to, it, it, it's going to offer capabilities or skills to developers to get things done, right? It may be enabling somebody to talk to a rewards program at a bank, or it could be summoning the Avengers. But whatever the case is, it is allowing you to perform some sort of skill or action with this API. Uh, Ken Lane, uh, the API evangelist, which is a great site to, uh, to monitor if you're not monitoring it, was uh, recently speaking to a university conducting API workshops, teaching how to use APIs and how to think about them. This is how he approached APIs. You'll notice there's no gets, no posts, no puts, no deletes, <clears throat> nothing HTTP related. Right? What he's actually trying to do is help people understand what are the skills or what is it that the API helps me to do? What's the outcome? What's the goal? What am I trying to do? What's the job to be done? And how is this API going to help me get there? And he was using this as an example based on like Ift or Zapier. Uh, anybody ever heard of Ift or Zapier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so most, some of you have. So uh, a great tool helps us to connect APIs together, automate workflows, can monitor Dropbox, send me an email, monitor an RSS feed, fire off a tweet, those kinds of things. And I don't have to write any code, it's all hosted by them. So he takes that kind of uh, approach to laying out what the skills of an API is. So this is important when we're designing our API because we have to think not just about what are the verbs, what are the response codes, what are the URIs, but really what is it that my API is really trying to do. Another one that I found today that I wanted to share, oh, that's kind of hard to read, unfortunately. Um, Ticketmaster has an API that they just released, I believe they just announced today or at least went public today with it, and they have a variety of different APIs that go from discovery of uh, new events to actually conducting commerce, interacting as a partner with Ticketmaster and so on, uh, they enable people to interact with them in different ways based on who they are. You may be an individual, you may be building a mobile app for an individual to conduct uh, you know, search and buy some tickets, or you could be someone who's trying to put uh, events into their system and they've segmented their APIs and focused on what the different contexts are, which we're gonna talk about, and then how those skills apply to each of those contexts. All of this goes back to design, which goes back to some architectural principles and why we're here today. The idea that architecture is design, I think Grady Booch said it best in this little tweet, he captured, I think, the essence of architecture. 
He said, Archi all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. Architecture are the most significant design decisions of software. Right? So when we think about it, we're not talking about those uh, astronaut architects that sit up in their ivory towers and, and you know, come up with some design and slap in some diagrams and lots of documents and thou shalts and thou shalt nots, roll it down to a dev team. This is about development teams cooperatively working together to define how software is going to intercommunicate and interact. Right? That is the core essence of APIs, but APIs are, at least our modern web APIs, are oftentimes extending that outside the walls of the organization, outside the walls of the software itself into public developers or partner developers' hands. So what we have to remember is when we think about API design, don't just get caught up in the verbs and the response codes and all the protocol details. Think about the fact that we're talking about actual design. And we need to be thoughtful about what we're building because it's going to, hopefully, last a long time. With that, what I like to do is talk about an outside-in API approach which helps drive toward a, a microservice domain-driven architecture. Uh, with that, Mike Abinson recently posted on uh, API Craft. If, you, if you're really into APIs, you want to get into kind of nitty gritty stuff. API Craft is a great Google group that you can join. People talk and ask questions about how to build APIs, how to design them. Uh, people were asking about what is the, you know, how, how do I define my API design? How do I figure out what my resources are? And he came up with four key things. It was a pretty long post. I've got it summarized here just to talk about it. He said, first of all, my data model is not my object model. So as software developers, we know that the way we store our data is probably different than the way we deal with it in code. This is particularly the case with object-oriented languages. Right? We, we, load, we have to use mappers and do all kinds of fancy work just to get our data from some sort of persistent store into code so we can work with it the way we want to as developers. So if that's the case, then my object model is not my resource model. My object model is how I want my software to collaborate internally. Those are the internal details of how I'm going to realize, solve the problem at hand. That's not necessarily the resources that I want to expose to public or partner developers when I build an API. Those are two different things. Exposing those internal details is like breaking encapsulation in O terms. Right? We need to define, we need to figure out what it is we're really trying to define and define that clearly and cleanly. He then went on to, to say that his resource model is not his representation model. <coughs> what that means is just because we define our resources does not mean we define what those resources look like. That, that, that transportation format, that representation in JSON, XML, CSV, HTML, whatever we decide to, to roll it into, may look different and that may have an impact on the behavior of how our resources work when we build our endpoints. Okay? So we have to take that into account. So, so are you looking for critiques during this process or you okay. just uh, if you have a question let me know and if you have critiques then we'll, we can just grab me afterwards okay or shoot me an owners thanks all right so when we start looking at uh, domain driven design and microservices and API design what I'd like to do is start from a systems design perspective who's familiar with systems design who's familiar with the term yeah so I, I think we've sort of lost that ability. I mean, you might realize that you've been doing it for a while and, and just hadn't thought about the term. But, but I think there's a lot of us that have, have started to lose this ability or are not aware of this skill that we can use to help try to find our API. So that's a lot of what I teach to, to try to help find those APIs. So the question I want to ask, what skills do your API need to offer? The first thing we need to do when we're doing our API design is what is it really we're trying to do? And this is going to help us drive toward our systems design and our domain driven design. So if we were building some kind of shopping cart or something, there's some sort of activity or outcome we want. We want to go to place an order. As a customer, I want to go to place an order. What are those steps that are required to get there? Okay. This is the idea of some people see it as business process engineering, BPE. It's basically the idea of taking some sort of goal or idea and breaking it down into steps. These steps will end up being parts of our API. So we need to figure out what it is we're trying to do and then go through and capture that in some way, however you want to do that. When we go through this process, what we end up doing is starting, we start our domain-driven design process at the same time. Part of domain-driven design is the ubiquitous language UL. Right? And the idea that 
we want to be on the same level of vocabulary. And we'll talk a little bit about being, I'll define it a little bit further for you in a bit, uh, what domain-driven design is for those that aren't familiar with it. But no matter what, we want to make sure that we're on the same page as everyone else involved, including product managers, lines of business, whatever we're dealing with. Okay? We all want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. There's nothing worse than writing up a bunch of code, getting to the end and going, oh, you didn't mean this, you meant that. Oh, okay, well great, okay. We'll need a couple more months to retool all this code because we made some core assumptions about what some of these concepts were. So we want to get these things defined. So having discussions about the requirements, what it is we're trying to do, what are we calling things, how do things relate, who's allowed to do what things, right? all those kinds of business rules that we need to capture, going through that up front is going to help shape our API design. Once we do that, we can start looking for resources. Now, uh, in domain-driven design terms, uh, the, the goal of uh, domain-driven design is to really be able to map concepts into software. We want to be able to have business, product, everybody at the table and be able to have a discussion about software. So when we map these things down, we want to be able to talk about the same kinds of concepts. When we do that and we have domain experts in the room, room, we can have a very focused discussion on what we're trying to build and, that, and know that we're going to build it right. We can build that common vocabulary and then we can place boundaries around these different concepts to group things together based on like concerns. Domain-driven design is commonly used for very complex systems. If you're just building a simple system that you can build up with, uh, with, with Rails or Django or Express or something and, and stand something up, you may not need to use this technique. But when you have large teams or multiple teams and you need to be able to have the uh, opportunity to communicate between them and share learning, then things like domain-driven design really help. So I wonder if all of that at Amazon, he made a big point in his uh, keynote uh, at, his, uh, uh, at his conference um, about how systems evolve from smaller systems. Mm -hmm. And I have an enterprise, you know, allergic reaction to what you just said about needing domain-driven design for big systems. Um, I very much agree with Warner that small APIs, small microservices, and composing them in a, in a sane fashion is, is a key scalable design principle. Okay. Um, so again, so my question then becomes, domain-driven design is to me a, con a concept from large systems design theory that practice has largely rejected. And um, I, would, I would argue that um, it is time to transcend domain-driven design to talk about um, constraints on your microservices to build stable systems. And that's a different process than traditional domain-driven design. So um, that's my, I guess that's my prologue. So okay. my question to you is, why are you using domain-driven design in this world of microservices? I'll show you how it fits. <laughs> <laughs> give me a little bit of time. Okay, I'll give you time. All right. All right, so um, given that, what we want to do then is if we know what our core concepts are for our system, how everything fits, how everything's related, we can draw boxes around things to scope it into smaller units that are manageable, then that allows us to create smaller bounded services that can have APIs around them that we can swap out as we learn new things over time. So let me show you how this works. What I use domain-driven design for is to help identify the boundaries for really complex systems that are going to offer up a number of APIs. So something along the lines of Ticketmaster, where we have multiple paths through, multiple roles, multiple contexts coming through, talking to a system based on who they are, what they need to do, and what the outcomes are going to be for that. I've worked on systems that you know have hundreds and hundreds of endpoints, not because the system was built in a monolithic fashion, but rather because 
the problem space that was being solved had a lot of different contexts and aspects that needed to be dealt with. So we had to figure out a way to draw boundaries, draw lines around what we were building. So what I do, tend to do is take a top-down design as opposed to a bottom-up, and rather than looking for those little bits of code and say, okay, well, here's, here's some little piece of code I'm going to build a service for, which is a valid way to do it, I tend to come in from the top down and say, okay, from the outside in, here is the product I have to deliver to market. If I have to deliver this product to market, they don't care how many microservices I have. They care that I deliver the right product with the right API that solves the right problem at the right time. So I look at it from the outside in, and then I work my way in. Okay, so what we've done now is we have through, and I, I asked about system design earlier, and there's a reason I asked for it. We use Laravel, Rails, Django, Express. We've used those types of frameworks, right? I love them. I started with Rails back in 05 or so. Nice. Early adopter. Wow, you're old. I am. Hang on. See, see he's so nice. I just got <laughs> <a> four bastards. <laughs> it was an escape from Java and J2E, so. <laughs> okay, so you went from hell to something like purgatory. Okay, great. Get off my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we used all these frameworks, and they were fantastic compared to what we used to, how we used to build <coughs> software, right? Yeah. Here's the problem that I found, and others have found as well, I believe. We forgot how to modularize our software. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. That's why Andrew's talking about microservices and saying, I'm having fits about some of what you're talking about because I'm coming from the enterprise days. Well, I came from there too, right? I, I know. And when, when I went to a framework like this, I went, this is brilliant. It's opinionated. It tells me where to put my, salt, my code and everything else. It said that now what I'm doing is I'm saying that all of my code is in the models directory. Okay? Or controllers. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are two places. You yeah. have a choice. <laughs> yeah. um, and anything that doesn't fit goes in the lib directory. Right, if it doesn't fit. <laughs> so I shove everything in there. This is pretty common for Rails, all you giggling, you've probably seen yeah, that, and I know a lot of the other frameworks are very similar. Right? Of course they are. They all are so we forgot how to modularize. Uh, but we got speed. We got speed of development. We sacrificed that to be able to get things up and running, but then we see problems emerge where software starts to get hard to work with. People complain. Uh, and instead of taking a modular approach where maybe we divide things up into smaller, services, smaller modules that we stitch together either into a single process, but we modularize our code so we have a manageable monolithic code base, or we break them out into now what is trending as microservices. Right? We, we start to break things apart, distribute it, put teams around it, everything else. This is what I call monolithic regret. Um, because a lot of people go down that path of building a monolith. It's not really about the monolith. There's nothing particularly wrong about a monolith for a lot of systems. But it's the way, the fact that we don't modularize it that is the problem. Yeah. In the conversation about microservices, and I guess depending on who you ask, they say in some ways it's most people start with the monolith to understand what the dependencies are. Yes. And as long as you build a monolith with enough uh, you know, unit testing stuff, you can refactor. So later you are able to create better modules. Because if you come in, maybe you don't have the experts and you break it apart incorrectly, that could be more damage. If, you know, shared objects yes. and that kind of stuff. I absolutely you, you agree. You add complexity in the microservice. Yeah, you don't I disagree. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I agree. What, what I generally say is it's, it's much easier to refactor code inside of, of, uh, of an editor when you're dealing with in-process calls and you're not going over distributed lines right. and you're not having to move code across right. repositories. Um, but just because you have great test coverage doesn't mean you have a modular system. Because no. I've seen some, so, so what it really means is we have to think in a modular fashion. So if you, if you build the code in a modular, no, no, in a code-based no, modular fashion, you kind of tease it apart. I mean, I, I forgot his name, but the, that talks about Microsoft says in some ways, coming from the experience of the model, you understand what the dependencies are already of the yes. internal. So you can build a better Microsoft as a version two, mm -hmm. and you, by the way, sometimes if you start straight into microservices, if you don't design it right, you might end a lot of microservices are not doing that one thing and they have a lot of dependencies and you have more complexity. Yeah, I, I, I agree. This is yeah. the guy that... So, so I'm looking at this slide and uh, I've seen, like I've seen this before as a file management problem, right? Where like models would have accounts <laughs> model and inventory model, orders model, right? So 
But I think you're talking about something more there than a yeah. kind of file management problem. I don't really understand that. So that's okay. my question. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, it isn't a file management problem. I demonstrate it or I try to visualize it through, you know, a screenshot from my Mac, from my, <laughs> my <laughs> Finder. Uh, what it really is about is if, if you've used any kind of language that have keyword modifiers for scope of code, you can, you know, Java, you had public, private, protected, and package were the common ones. Mm -hmm. So depending on how you wanted people to access the code, you could limit external access. Mm -hmm. So ideally, when we had a module here like an accounts, we'd have some sort of series of public APIs, publicly scoped methods if it were in just a single code base. And we would say, you're allowed to talk to this. And then that's the entry point for that module. That's our API for that module. And then inside that module, we could have code that only could talk to one another, but couldn't be accessed internally. It's where we get into the uh, high cohesion, where the code is, is related and together because it's related, but loose coupling, meaning these two modules, the only thing they know about are those public APIs that are exposed. They don't know how things are going on internally, and they can't reach around that public API and get access to it. When we go down these framework paths, what happens is everything ends up being public. Everything becomes global, and we're not having cleaner control unless we take those steps to write modular code, which unfortunately the frameworks don't encourage. So then as the code base grows, we get into those kind of situations where we can't, uh, where, where all of our code starts to become spaghetti code because it's very hard to manage. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my application that I work with on a daily basis looks a lot like the one on the left. Uh -huh. And we're trying to make it look more like the one on the right. And we think about it in terms of the, the left being horizontal slices of the application, layers, and the right being vertical slices or domains. Yes. Found in context. So That's a great way. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. It's a great way to think about it. And just like Kanban, move to the right, right? <laughs> okay, so microservices. So if we've gone through this process of thinking about what skills our API design needs to have, then we need to start thinking about how we're going to actually put it all together. Um, microservices, for those who aren't familiar, everybody has a different definition, okay? I put some of the hot spot ideas up here on the slide just to clarify. But the idea is they're independently deployable services. They tend to be loose coupled. They expose some sort of API, either through messaging, through request response, sometimes through HTTP, sometimes through another protocol. They usually have some sort of bounded context. The goal of the bounded context is to keep the solution space small so that it's very easy to understand the code. It's really not about line count. It's about complexity of the solution that's being, or the problem that's being solved within those bounded contexts. Uh, microservices generally use a lot of automation. When you get into an environment, mm, kind of a modest size or a moderate size SaaS, you may have anywhere between tens to hundreds of microservices. We're seeing with big companies like Netflix and, and others, we're seeing hundreds and hundreds to thousands of microservice possibilities, right? Depending on where they draw their boundaries, how many teams they have. As you start increasing your code, uh, the number of isolated, separated services, you need to get that deployed, you need heavy automation. You need continuous deployment, you have easy release. People go to platform as a service solutions, they dockerize, use Docker containers, they do as much automation as they can to make their code get out to production as easily as possible. Because they don't want to have to put any kind of friction between building a service and getting it out there. But the idea really moves beyond that to the idea of replaceability or experimentation. <clears throat> If I'm building a public API, as long as that contract stays the same, it doesn't matter behind the scenes. Is it one monolithic code base? Am I decomposing it into microservices? It doesn't matter what it really looks like. Right? Um, so I can replace and swap out microservices, uh, and, and as long as that behavior is the same internally, then I can change out programming languages, I can change out the approach that I'm using or whatnot. So performance is a feature, and too many microservices introduce latency, error paths, a whole bunch of things. So that's the major knock on microservices. So you just asserted that you know APIs are are coordination points, but performance is actually a characteristic that your clients do depend upon, mm -hmm. and the, the error paths are going to be very very important in terms of usability and capability. So 
Um, I would argue that the errors are still there in monolithic architecture versus a uh, loosely coupled architecture, but the latencies are higher in a loosely coupled architecture. Okay. I would agree. Right. Yeah. So um, there are some there are some downsides. There's some extremely good scalability characteristics that come from the microservice architecture, and you have to have to balance the two of those. That's very true. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, domain-driven design helps building the API. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that um, uh, domain-driven design helps you um, have those boundaries for the microservices. That suggests that there's, it's, a, it's being used in two different levels, for building the API and a, at the other level to break up the uh, boundaries of the microservice so you can have a microservice yeah. architecture, right? That, that's that true. Right? Just a little bit of time and we'll get there. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So, so the idea of when we, so we go from API design and we start trying to define the contract and we look at our skills, then we have to start figuring out how we're gonna find boundaries. One of those things that we're gonna do when we look at boundaries is we need to decide that we wanna roll out microservices, so we need to find those boundaries. Um, so, all that to say that microservices require us to have a renewed focus on our architecture because what we're really doing is we're making a fundamental decision to say, as I'm going through this API design process and I'm figuring out what I need to deliver to market and then I'm going to figure out how I'm going to compose this together, I need to start revisiting some key, um, key ideas on systems design. So systems design is something uh, can be really just mapped out in just a very simple uh, diagram like this. If we say that this dashed line is a system, a solution that we're going to provide, some sort of uh, a solution that we may be delivering, it may be as small as a microservice, it may be as large as, as a complete running application. We can then have subsystems that subdivide the functionality into smaller isolated bounded areas, any number of subsystems. Right? And then inside there, we can have modules. And these modules are like our building blocks. It could be a single class or function, or it could be something you know, that collaborates between several of them. Our subsystems, when they get really complex, we can decompose them into smaller subsystems. You see that a lot of times on more complex things like operating systems or really complex you know, software systems, but a lot of operating systems, um, uh, SDKs for things like mobile development and such, they'll actually have things divided into smaller subsystems and then they expose a general API with an SDK to be able to interact with those pieces of functionality. The best way that I can describe it is with Lego. And who, you know, we need to talk with some Lego, right? <laughs> So my son is six, he loves Lego. For Christmas he asked for this police station, so he said, anybody worked with the city Lego before? Anybody done that <coughs> a couple of years? Really cool, I, it's amazing. 854 pieces for this police station. And I think, oh man. Okay, so when I had a kit that was about 854 pieces, it came with two booklets. You plow through the first one serially and then you go into the next one. The city system from Lego is not like that. What they've actually done it said, this is a system, and then we have six books with bags with the parts in them numbered that correspond to those books. So they're like 10 or 12 bags. Some of the books use a couple of bags, some of them just one, okay? And they all correspond to one another. They've divided the problem into system and subsystems, and then when we're building things, we sometimes have to build, say, a fender or a roof, and then we attach it to the vehicle, and then we go on and we build something else. So we can build these little modules, these different little pieces, connect them all together, create this left building, the middle building, the right building, and then we connect all those together, and then we have the kit. What's really interesting about that is it gave me the opportunity with my son to work with him. He could work on what he wanted to work on. He decided he wanted to work on the cars. So he grabbed one of the cars, he grabbed the kit, grabbed the bag for him, and he just followed the instructions, went through and did it. While I worked on some of the buildings, which had a lot more pieces, took a lot more time. We could theoretically have had six different people working on this at the same time because it was subdivided into isolated modules that were built up and then connected together to solve the problem. Yeah. I'd like to make a uh, caveat statement to the statement uh, previously about latency. With the uh, microservices, um, there is some inherent latency. However, um, if you're building a system correctly, um, you can do a lot of things in parallel. So even though an individual um, action may take longer than if it was in a monolith, you could do more things in parallel to get the entire system done faster. Hmm. I think I said that, I said scalable, microservices more, more scalable. But 
I agree. Okay. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. So <coughs> just an observation, but nice. Uh, you picked Lego, mm -hmm. but there's nothing cross-cutting between things, right? There is no electric. There is no gas. Like if you're building a city, uh, there is no sewage, right? There is nothing <laughs> shared between <laughs> two things, so you can build it easily. But when you come to think of it, like your analogy is a city to an application, but there are a lot of things that cross cut right. the uh, different uh, different systems and subsystems. So it's a good thought. Yeah. So the yeah. uh, modular design means you have no dependencies to work parallel with one another. So you need to soar and then work on cars, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the idea of this was they took a problem that was complex and subdivided into areas that could actually be worked on in isolation. Together, they came back together to actually build something that's fun to play with more than just one of these, perhaps, right? So they create a complete solution. But the idea was that there were building blocks here where we took the problem and subdivided in, which did allow for parallel building which really maps to some of the concepts of microservices, right? Because the idea of if I can surround a team or a person with each one of these and work in parallel, as long as we agree upon those interfaces of how they're gonna work in between. That's a great way to put the analogy. Right. Yeah, it's really good. So if you had twins, you could multi-thread it pretty easily. <laughs> nice, yes. <laughs> uh, the city systems also, you know, when you speak about uh, cross-cutting concerns, the idea that there is a system of systems, right? So now what we have is we could have a city with a variety of different Lego systems put together. All of these different uh, different things from boats and planes to, to cars, vehicles, all these different things you can build could be parallel as out. So uh, maybe next month Keith will bring a bunch of uh, Lego city sets and we'll all divide up into tables and we'll you know? share nicely. As long as we say everything is awesome. I try. Okay. <laughs> so we have systems all over here. All right. So let's talk about how to put all this together. This was a lot of information. How do we put it all together? All right. I worked on a um, multi-sided marketplace uh, software as a service uh, about a year or so ago. And uh, while I can't talk a lot about it, what I can do is I can pull out some of the general principles of how we approached building the API. It was a multi-sided marketplace that dealt with uh, online e-commerce in the, uh, in, in the uh, activities and rental space. And a lot of what we had to build was focused toward two different parties. We had operators and distributors. The operators had the activities or the things to rent, whatever it is they wanted to offer up. The distributor had a channel of customers that they wanted to be able to offer up these different items. What we did is we went through the process of figuring out what is it that we're really trying to offer? What are these APIs? How many APIs do we need? How many products do we need? Where are the boundaries? We had to figure all this out. So imagine being dumped into a domain that you never heard of before. I'm sure none of us have ever had to do that as developers, right? You sit down, you go, okay, you gotta get your head around the domain. So you start defining the vocabulary. So you're figuring out what it is that's in scope, what it is you're trying to do, and you start mapping it out. So we took the same approach that I showed you earlier, just kind of laid it out in a grid view, and then we started laying things out um, uh, in a little bit more loose form and, and kind of shuffled it around to see where everything belonged. Now part of what we did is we looked to see what things, what steps, you know, what were the output or the activities we're trying to do, the outcomes, and then we broke it into steps, and then we figured out who's participating in each of those steps, who's involved with it. So we could see where our activity centered around, who are they centered around, and how are we putting it all together. So we did this first, and, uh, and we came up with, and there was a lot more than this, but to be able to read the slide, I had to keep it kind of simple, but, but this was it. So what we did is we, we found these, and then conveniently enough, they're all in the same spot where I can draw boxes around. We had to move them around and figure out where they belong. And what we did is we figured out that we had some things related to inventory management. All the operators dealt with it. We were interacting with the same kinds of concepts, products. We had order management where the distributors were actually trying to list available inventory, find things, create orders, 
interact with, uh, with orders and complete them. Uh, and then we have a fulfillment process where once the order had been placed, we have a point of sale system. So you bring your ticket or you bring your, your reservation uh, receipt or email or whatnot and show up and, re and, and redeem it. So those are the three core systems. So we looked at that and we said, all right, well, we have all these different items. We grouped them together and we realized we had these three different subsystems. We need to deal with order management, inventory management, and fulfillment. From there, then we started looking at the API design. This is where we could take our uh, API design principles and start looking at how do we find the APIs that exist. The first thing we did is we said, all right, well, let's, let's figure out if what, what kind of APIs we have and start grouping things together. So each subsystem, if we just take a modular perspective, yeah. I just want to uh, maybe ex extend the question about boundaries. Uh, I get it conceptually, but looking at your example, and uh, it's oversimplified, I understand that as well. Uh, why did you put available inventory or least available inventory into OER API? I uh, will talk about it in just a second. Good question and, and um, leading up to it. Uh, so what we did is we said, all right, based on uh, basic uh, decomposition, system decomposition, we found some subsystems. Let's just assume that we have APIs around them to begin with. Those are going to be the APIs we're going to expose. Once we figure out what core APIs we're going to have and what those APIs need to do, the next thing that we did is we wanted to look for where the product boundaries are. And the primary reason for that is because we're going to be going to market with multiple products. We had different people in this multi-sided marketplace we had to deal with, different parties. By mapping this out, we were able to figure out, first of all, that we had a distributor who was interested in dealing with orders, but in no way reflected a number of other types of skills. So they did not need to see everything that was over here on the, on the right side, or uh, yeah, on the right side. The distributors didn't need to see any of that. So as we mapped out what our system needed to do, figured out what skills our APIs were going to provide, we started to find where those dividing lines were. The importance of this is that when we're building our APIs and defining what our different domain objects are, what the, the entities are, what the names are, uh, what our APIs are going to look like, what the resource names are, and so on, we need to know who our target audience is. What is their vocabulary? And some of the vocabulary that we used internally might not have directly mapped to the marketplace. We wanted to perhaps tailor documentation, API design, other things to keep in mind the context of the people using the API. How do they think about their world? Different than maybe we think about it internally. Once we have our API, then we need to start digging into what the resources are. This is where I really start applying domain-driven design, because I start looking for what are my key, what are my key entities across this solution set. In this case, I start looking and I see that I have product, and I have bookings, I have orders, uh, you know, availabilities, and so on. And this is kind of based on this simple example, uh, a rough sketch of what we came up with. To the question of products versus availabilities. It's about boundaries. It's about boundaries. When we're dealing with inventory, uh, we're dealing with parties that are, that are controlling their catalog of inventory and their definition of schedules of when things are available. Say it's a walking tour or a, a bus tour or something. There are certain constraints of, of when that particular item is available, so there's going to be rules associated with it. On this side, on the order API, we're dealing with the distribution channel. We're looking, people want to look to find things that are currently available. So what we had were things that were available, product offerings are available that were based on some sort of time-based recurring schedule oftentimes, or based on quantity or other things, compared to the definition of what it actually looks like, how we define it, how we manage it, how we manage the inventory. Maybe just to finish my thought, uh, again, I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, I get that boundaries are defined based on the target audience uh, mm -hmm. in the product, and actually I'm a product manager, it makes total sense. Yeah. Uh, from my implementation standpoint, uh, I don't see connection with microservices, or I see maybe violation of microservices, because availabilities, uh, essentially, and products uh, are different now for the same data model, and uh, probably they will share the same database, or, or no? No, they won't. Sh they won't. Yeah, they won't. Um, so the idea is, it, even though you have duplication, typically in a microservices space, even though you might have duplication, 
of a particular entity. There's, there are likely in, in domain driven design you have the typically a, 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 an aggregate. And an aggregate, the concept is you have a, a lead entity or a root entity that's generally the primary thing that, that you're interacting with within that particular boundary. And then you have other things that are dependent on it. So a, the product information that's over here could very well be duplicated over here okay. for display purposes or for rendering purposes. And then if you need to get back to the original definition, you can go over there. So throughout the process was we're finding our different entities, then we start looking for kind of what are the high level attributes or fields that we want to define, right? What are the things that we're really looking for? These are the key differentiating attributes to define each of these uh, different domain entities. We want to look for the relationships between them. This gives us an idea of what our, root, what our roots may be within a particular space. And then we also want to look for events. To me, events, I think, are the most often overlooked thing when we're designing APIs. Uh, we, more often than not, look at our request response world, but we don't necessarily think about what kind of interesting things can happen when we emit events within our APIs, either via webhooks or streaming events using a variety of different protocols. GitHub wouldn't be as powerful as it is without their webhooks, right? That's how we do so much of what we do when we use GitHub or GitLab or anything else. Those webhooks that tell systems when commits have occurred, when new versions have been updated on so whatever branch and, and so on. Okay. Can, uh, I don't know what a webhook is. Okay. Can you explain it? Please? Yeah, so basically a webhook is, is the idea that rather than you calling, say I'm an API, rather than you calling me, you're going to tell me where to call you. So you're going to actually have an endpoint, an API endpoint, mm. and I'm going to tell you how I'm going to send the data. You tell me what the URL is, I'm going to give it to you. So okay. it's an event notification over HTTP okay. by making yeah. basically kind of like a reverse the reverse call. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, Hollywood principle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that kind of on back? Yeah. Yes. It is. Yeah. That's why yeah. don't call me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly it. So when we're, when we're figuring out what our API needs to look like, part of what we should be doing in design is what kind of events should we be uh, considering uh, emitting from our API. Now when we're going down into the smaller microservice world, these are going to be events that we may be emitting internally. When this is a public or a partner API, this may be something that's going over, you know, over HTTP, whereas maybe internally it's going over a message bus or RabbitMQ or Kafka or something like that. But we have a great opportunity to find ways to make our platform even stickier by designing an API that offers event hooks so that not only can we accept incoming requests and do work, but we can also inform uh, systems outside of our own when things change and create that stickiness by having two-way communication back and forth. We can push things in, we can get notified when things change that were changed by somebody else outside, away from us. Also allows for great ways of data synchronization and other things between systems. All right, so putting all that together, that's, that's kind of a, a rough step of how we outlined our public API. Then you can start mapping this API over into HTTP or whatever, you know, protocols that you want to use, you want to support. Now, let's talk a little bit about microservices and where they fit. Um, as I said earlier, but I'm going to reiterate, public APIs, we want durability. We want long-lasting APIs. We want things that don't change, right? They need to be durable. They need to be long-lasting. They, they really need to be immutable. Um, or at least we need to accept the change ourselves for those public APIs whenever it makes the most sense for the business. Microservice APIs, we want to allow ourselves the ability to replace those and swap those out as we move forward. Because that's an implementation detail that we can own inside our own walls, right? Inside our own systems, as we stand up new microservice APIs, we could decide that we want to add a new service that looks like the other one, or maybe behaves a little different than the other one, uses a different programming language or a different um, algorithm or whatever we decide to do. So we have a little bit more experimentation. That's that's along the lines of the domain-driven design philosophy of continue to seek clarity and understanding and refactor, but rather than refactoring through the single code base, we're actually refactoring across uh, services with our public APIs being that, that front end to it. 
So I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like in a second. Um, so what I generally recommend when you take a top-down approach is to start by looking at these APIs and finding some of these core, core areas of concern. In this case, I just mapped some basic services over based on the entities that exist and the kind of functionality they're going to have to offer to the public API. We may consider decomposing these into smaller microservices depending on what we need to do. The thing that I'm seeing a lot with, uh, with teams that are moving toward microservices is they tend to be concerned about making their services very small, as small as they possibly can, or, or they end up getting into this realm of almost nano services. They do very small, discrete things. And, uh, and, and some people are finding that, that if they're too small, they become unwieldy. So what I generally recommend is start by looking at the service first at maybe a domain entity perspective or a particular um, type of responsibility, and then find those things that are really, really difficult or complex and break those out. So if we have different kinds of calculations that need to be maintained separately, um, we could break those out and separate those out into services. Did you find any difference in the sort of the, the web services that you use, whether it's more RESTful base or more of the sort of SOA, or I'm sorry, of the RPC or like in this case, create a little bit or you're just referring as those methods, or you're. I mean, These this, are yeah. This is more like functionality, or just kind of not, showing. Okay. Yeah. Not saying that that's the actual. Yeah. So some RPC time. Right. Yeah. Most. So there's and and there's not. I'm not saying one's better than the other. I think every team has to make that decision. There are some that use the standard REST and use the HTTP verbs, and they map them to certain functionality because they, they it works for them the yeah. way they want to make it work. Um, others uh, choose RPC, or a lot of them are starting to, well, not a lot. Let me say some teams are starting to move away from HTTP for their microservices, and, uh, and they're trying to go as asynchronous as possible. Right. And uh, in doing so, yeah. they go away from it. They, they use message-driven, and maybe using Kafka or something else to drive it. And, yeah, yeah more of a reactive, or what we used to call old school, just like event-driven design, yeah. or stage-driven yeah. design, depending mm -hmm. on the <coughs> Old school. Yeah, a lot of the new things are really rebirths of old, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> old stuff. Yeah. Some of the some of the most performance systems I've ever built are event driven, right? And and if we if we think about the the half sync, half async um, architectural pattern that we can use or design pattern that we can use, right? Uh, the the sync side of us, the HTTP world, and then behind the scenes, as we talked about earlier with performance and microservices, being able to parallel that as much as possible. So this is, the, this is the approach that I use with the idea that as we're building up microservices and we have our dedicated data stores for them wherever it makes sense, we have a messaging backbone here where we're exchanging messaging messages between them, keeping things synced up or duplicating, you know, replicating data or keeping little bits of data that are most important to us. We have all these APIs and the next thing is how are we going to externalize this to the public and this is where we're designing this public API. So we're coming in from this direction, right? We're moving from left to right. We've come in and we said, this is what we need to do. This is how we're going to offer it. We found what our APIs are by decomposing the problem. And then from there, we break that into one or more microservices wherever it makes sense. And this allows us to have a more composable approach to how we're building software. We might have one API that's tailored to web and mobile, or we may have a few of them that we use. Uh, if we're going to, let's say, roll out an Alexa skill, uh, something that Capital One did recently and released in South by Southwest, they took some of their internal APIs, wrapped those into an API and integration endpoint for Alexa, so you can check your bank balance from, from Alexa, right, from Amazon Echo. Uh, is this uh, pretty much the same way as like an API gateway, where you're, you compose your, from the outside world, you're hitting one endpoint, maybe mm -hmm. a few endpoints, but then inside, you could have different combination of microservices yeah, and, and uh, that would be. Yeah, you can either write write the, write this from from scratch using a, a framework to, to build the API and then call it yourself. If you want to use a, an API gateway solution to be able to offer that same API that you've designed outward, and then use that to orchestrate the calls internally. Uh, and and I think we're going to see more of that. And some of the people, I think I think there's a a term that's been floating around a little bit. There's Boomi here in town that was bought by Dell, and they have a term called iPads Integration Platform as a Service, which is trying to, to go that direction, and API gateways are 
kind of trying to go that direction. You no, know, they refer to naked APIs where they're the simple, and then you put the plumbing through the API manager. Right, right, layer, right. Yeah, and so they do all the orchestration, they do all the yeah. mapping, yeah. they do transformation. Yeah, like yours is simple as yeah. parallel as possible, like that. Kind of so, so those of us that have the battle scars from the SOA days, we used to see ESBs thrown in, and we'd throw all of our transformation logic and everything in the ESBs. And then we had this big system that we had to all deploy at once because we had to make sure that our ESB code and all the transformation logic was there was synced up with all the services we're out to deploy. So we had these massive deploys and everything. What it's doing is kind of taking that concept, teasing it out, and saying, yeah, there's value in that orchestration, and you can plug solutions in there. And it's the opposite, right? They say keep your uh, endpoints smart and the messaging dumb. Yeah, right? it's, it's pulling the transformation and the orchestration logic out. Right. That was the, I mean, microservices yeah. say you try to do the opposite of the ESP. Yeah, you, right? you do the opposite here, and, and then smart this the smart the, yeah. yeah, the stuff is done as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So to that, I would just like to add that the API gateways are not only doing the orchestration, I'm, I'm seeing that in the industry quite a bit. They are also doing another aspect, which is missing the microservices domain, is security. Yeah. Mm. Very important, right? Services everywhere, how do you secure them? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a an API gateway. Metrics, right? uh, API gateway and API management are there's uh, API management tends. I've seen a lot of API management like Layer Seven or anything else that that sometimes offer that as well. And then the gateways are simply the uh, the pieces that that glue that thing together and do the translations too. So there, it's it's sort of interesting to see where there's a little bit of overlap between those worlds. But yeah, good point. A lot of security. Hmm. So as soon as you go asynchronous. You have error propagation issues. Mm -hmm. So, are you addressing any of that concept of how, if one of those microservices goes down, that we should be architecting our API products to actually handle the um, evanescence of the of the universe underneath us? Ah, errors don't happen, do they? <laughs> <laughs> they do. Um, not at this. Not for the purposes of this talk. No. Yes, when we get beyond this stage and a typical engagement. Yeah. All right, so um, this is sort of the idea that I'm trying to, and I need to, I'm going to revamp this slide a little bit to try to get a bigger picture of this. But really, the, the vision is this. If we start moving, and I mentioned this last month, I think, when, uh, when Jeff Lindsay was here, we were talking about kind of where things are going and sort of the direction he was trying to head, the vision of how he saw software being built and everything else. If we think about everything that we do, if we look at everything that we do, uh, everything we do as a company, our products, as well as everything we interact with, the different devices and everything else, when we think about the APIs that exist, we can start building and composing applications right from these APIs. We really start getting to a point where um, if tools start catching up, we'll be able to start building applications a lot easier, a lot quicker, typically the typical kind of throwaway applications or nice little mobile applications personal applications that allow us to talk to these different APIs. So I think being able to take these kinds of architectural skills to break down what your particular product or business does and look at what skills your API offers, now then step back and start thinking about where does that really fit? Yeah, I'm solving this problem today, but where is that really going to solve the problem moving forward? Right? And how am I going to interact? How is my business perhaps going to play one part of an entire workflow rather than the entire workflow. How can I get into that conversation and solve problems with my API? And doing that means we need to start thinking about how our API fits into the world of other people beyond perhaps the things that we're doing today. So I'm not sure if it's directly related to this, but you know, when you're trying to create those public APIs, there's this sort of analysis paralysis, right? You wanted to get it right, mm -hmm. uh, but then you don't know it's right until you try it. So the same way that you have emergent design and architecture in the agile world is like, how do you reduce the cost of change? Therefore, you have less. So in the API world, what's the equivalent? How can, what kind of practices of versioning, or what, what kind of things can you do to make the cost of that wrong first API that you can then iterate and change, even if it's public? Is there any? Does anybody know of a book that may talk about how to design APIs? I know of a book, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but somebody should have the, the Yeah. Um, generally, what we recommend is when you're when you're doing it, um, you 
the best way you can do it is to, to get as close as you can to what resources you're going to be offering so, and, and define what the behavior of those, those different endpoints are for those different resources. When you get into the payload aspects of being able to be flexible, how I'm going to update it without having a version, mm -hmm. then you can define certain rules. And some of the rules we define is uh, don't rename and don't delete fields, but you can add fields. Right. So what that means is start with a minimum representation mm -hmm. necessary to satisfy the requirements. Okay. Right? And, then you and then continue to add on if you need to, where it's appropriate to, to allow that resource to represent and support. And then adjust documentation depending on the consumer so that they only see the things that matter to them. I mean, because otherwise it can get also Yes, yes. And OK, so if you're talking about, let's say if you're rolling out Swagger right. and you have some endpoints that you're not ready to release publicly yet, you can, you can do things to tag and limit that visibility publicly. So that they can't see APIs that you're not ready for yet. The ones that are deprecated if they're new. Or... Yeah. The, the the challenge that I'm seeing right now a lot around this world is um, multi environment, multi version management of things like Swagger. Mm -hmm. Right? And and uh, I think Smart Bear is starting to come up with this idea of, of not really a repository, but something kind of like it. So that you can, as you push things through to different environments inside your organization the right Swagger file is being visualized to the right people at the right time. So QA is seeing the version they're QAing, not the version that's currently in production. Right. So you have to deal with environments, right. you have to deal with versions, right. Right. you have to deal with all those kinds of different nuances. And there's really not, everybody's having to bake their own right now, uh, but you can do that as well to kind of control the visibility of what's available and what's not until things get rolled out. So composability implies contracts, mm -hmm. right? And are there any tools that you're going to talk about or we should be looking at to help us enforce contracts on our APIs? Uh, so, no, there's no tools that I'm going to talk about. Um, there are some great tools out there, both testing tools, automated testing tools, and there are some libraries that are starting to merge to enforce verify contracts either at design time or at runtime, things like RunScope and others that can you can use to monitor the traffic and make sure that you don't get outside of the uh, RunScope is a great tool for that. Also here, uh, two or three months ago, we had one of the Postman team talk about the product they are releasing the next day that does exactly that. So if you look at the um, Capital Factory meetup videos, you'll find that presentation. I want to say it's from February. What's it called again? Um, it's, it's Postman's new tool. Um, I forget the name of it. Newman. All the time. Yeah. Sorry? Is it Newman? It's Postman. Newman. I think yeah. that's it, yeah. yeah. New Postman, Newman. Yeah. What are they? But, um, what are they so they, they released that, uh, in, I think it was in February, right after the meetup here. So uh, definitely check out that video if you get a chance. What does it do? Sorry, yeah, like high level? It does, it does the contract testing. So you're saying, I expect it to have this. Yeah. It better have that. Okay. Yeah. And you, you can automate it via CLI, Postman, CUI, new to the CLI version. Yeah. Oh. So, so I, there, so I do like small, medium-sized projects. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was listening to you talk about sending the Swagger to the QA team in different versions, I was like, that sounds horrible. And maybe that's like, maybe that's just how it works, but it seems like there should be a better way. And, and I don't know what that's like. I don't know what that is, but are there are there like better alternatives to that? Because like I worked with Swagger, I did a thing in Swagger, and mm -hmm. I was like, this doesn't seem like it's really helping <laughs> the, like the craft of software yeah. development. And yeah, maybe that's there again. That's just how I thought. No, there, there's actually quite a bit of discussion going on right now of what, where's the value add. In fact, there was a discussion on a, on a Slack group that I was in the other day around that very topic. Um, and uh, for some teams, it works well because either they drive you know, testing and automation and, and the design process through it. Um, or you know they, they they use it in some way to facilitate their automation contract verification what you know what are, what are the things that they're doing okay um, for for others they use it to drive more of the documentation as the output and people would okay. then argue well so I could write better documentation probably without swagger and that argument could be made but I, I think there's something to be said for defining Having a definition of what your API does so that when the tooling catches up, 
I think there's going to be a point where we're going to want those definitions to exist to drive tooling beyond what we see tooling today and the things we're thinking about today. And that's really what, what I kind of think about is the, compo the, the world of composability is once we get to that point where, where we can use tools to compose applications by simply pulling in some sort of definition, whether it's Swagger or RAML or something, yeah, manifest it. Uh, and, and drive the, the creation of something or the automation of something, that'd be pretty powerful. So that's sort of kind of like uh, a discipline that maybe your team is may or may not find valuable right now, but I think will be valuable moving forward. Is that that's almost sounds like an API in front of the API, like your or is that different? Yeah, it's 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 more of a, a meta a definition of the API. Well, isn't right? that what wisdom? I mean, is that yeah? I mean, it's just a design first, or what is that uh, API world design first or? API first, or whatever, uh, API, yeah, yeah, design first. Isn't that a little bit in that kind of? It's Swagger yeah, it's is the design, API, you know, design first, but tools like Raml, he says you code the generation, then out of that you have a meta and you generate. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We're okay. All right, so we've got just a few more minutes. Uh, one last question. I just want, I just want to make a comment. Okay. I work with a lot of customers, and in their design of APIs, what I've noticed groups that separate our UI development from API development have more mature, more usable APIs than ones where the developers who are doing the UI are also creating the oh, APIs. Oh yeah, because they're All very- All the APIs end up becoming like crud. Tunnel vision. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted That's to- That's a good point, yeah, thank you. So I feel like, um, to put this in basic terms, I like to understand things by basic terms. A lot of this is kind of applying a, traditional uh, just good software engineering practices yep, to a larger <laughs> a larger picture like things like uh, uh, program by an interface uh, information hiding yeah um, I, I wanted to say that the I had a question for you though how how independent do you develop your services do they all um, have their own data stores and, are, and those data stores are updated by these events or do some of your APIs call other APIs as but that's kind of creates this dependency web. Yeah, I feel like so. How independent uh, do you create your APIs? Because you want them to be replaceable. Yeah, kind of lose a couple. Right. I think most people have seen in the ideal state that the more that they can decouple, the better, right? And meaning that if you emit events or you send out messages on a message bus, and I'm interested in when some product changes, and I want to store the name if the name has changed locally. Uh, that's the best way to go so that I don't have to make a, a call, particularly if, if because the milliseconds will add up, right? If I have to go call another service, then that's how much longer that I have yeah. to, to make that request come back. And when you're working in something like Ruby or, or something, then you're dealing with, with, with uh, you know, slow, slower performance. When you're dealing with Node, you're seeing a little bit faster performance. When you're dealing with Java, C, other things like that, then you see, you know, really high performance. So it depends on what you're doing and what your latency is and everything else. So a lot of people will, will do that. And uh, um, the enterprises are always accused of and tend to still depend on their ETL processes and their data replication. And they're trying to get away from that. Those, hard habit, those are hard habits to break for some of them. So but move towards, instead of replication being in like stored procedures, right. uh, move towards an event. Event driven. Uh, moving yeah. into the code. As soon as you move to event driven, everyone's eyes will open and they'll go, wow, we can do this, and oh, we can do that, and we can do this, right? But it takes that, those first steps to start getting people to do it and, and to, start, to start really driving toward that. Yeah. Okay, so, um, really just, just had a uh, quick summary. Remember, great API design um, will drive your product adoption or will drive down your product adoption. <coughs> drive it up or down. Um, it is an architectural concern, so we want to make sure that we're focused on architectural principles, and to your point, just good engineering, right? Let's kind of get back to that good, good engineering again. I mean, the principles are still the same, we're just realizing them in different ways. Um, and then when we break things down using system design, domain-driven design, uh, it gives us an opportunity to really decompose our system into different areas, find those boundaries, and then see what kind of opportunities we have for microservices. But most of all, be a storyteller with your APIs. Tell stories to markets, tell stories about what your APIs can do, focus on solving problems, 
and then let the HDP details and all the things that we like to debate and figure out what's right and what's wrong, let that stuff kind of set aside for a second, make sure you're focused on delivering a great solution to a market and that you can tell a great story with what your API can do. books to give away. I will do this in two phases. So this is using a system called Raffle, which is written by Ian up here. Um, all right, so I'm going to raffle off these three books. First one is uh, Mike Stowe's Undisturbed Rest, a guide to designing the perfect API. <laughs> We've got two copies of that. <laughs> and O'Reilly's Docker Cookbook, which I believe just came out in the last month or so. They sent me a free copy of it. Uh, so let me go ahead and hit the button here. So if you could pull out your phone and send a code, send code 103 to this phone number. Is it the first one who gets there? Or? No. 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 Everyone, everyone text in. We'll give, a, we'll give people a couple minutes to text in. And then I hit the button, and three people will get a text message with the, they're the winners. It's the privacy policy. Privacy policies, I will spam the hell out of you after this. <laughs> Actually, he can't because it's not on his server. Okay. Ian will spam the hell out of you after this. No guarantees. <laughs> if you don't have your phone, do you have a computer with Google or with Skype or Google on it? All right, sorry. <laughs> not this time around. Is anyone not entering? Is anyone not entering? Could he? Could you enter on his behalf? If you're not entering, you're, let me, here, I'll do it. You oh, James will do it for you. James got you. James got you. All right. So James is representing him. Got you. All right, 22. The phone number is 830-856-2595. If you are texting at home, stop. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yes, must be present to win. I have to be able to hand you this book, or I'll put it on eBay after this. How is that Twilio service? Uh, it is. Is it Twilio? It's backed by Twilio. Yes. Backed by Twilio, which is uh, API company of some sort. I don't know, man. It, yeah. It's just something I All right, we've got 33. That's about 80% of the people in the room. Last chance. Was this made just for the No, yeah, it's been around for about a year. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to hit select winners. One, two, three. And then wait for a second. Break, someone to be pissed. It's, it's sending the text messages in process. Okay, so sending text messages. Oh, shit. Why do you win? Sorry. Oh, what'd you win? <laughs> Which one'd you win? Undisturbed rest. Undisturbed rest. Here you go. What'd you win? Docker book. Who else? One more? All right. Here we go. Thank you. Oh, I see right. a lot of uh, raffles going on. You should share that around. And now this big prize. <laughs> Okay, another big prize. This is a MouseCon bronze badge. Badge from CA. Oh, wait. Austin and API. Here we go. All right. And what is the value of an OSCON bronze badge? Like $6 million. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. It's like $400, yeah. Okay. So this is the same number as before. Text in the code 104 to enter this contest. Go ahead and tell us about computer associates. So um, CA Technologies uh, has been around for a very long time. We do a lot of work with mainframe and uh, client server and web technologies. The space that I represent, my name is Banchal Prasad, is uh, API management. Um, CA acquired <coughs> layer 7 around three years ago, and uh, we put in a lot of work into API management. Our name to fame is really uh, security. That's where our main strength is. But we cover the whole gamut of uh, API management. All right. 
Thank you. Thank you. All right, wait. Yes. All right, wait. Hold it up. Hold it up, everyone. Ready? I'm hitting the button in three, two, one. Drum roll. You don't have to keep the drum roll up. It's just going to take it. You won? You won? Holy cow. Are you six zero zero? Any other housekeeping we have? Oh, uh, one thing I did want to throw up. Uh, who was here for the March meetup over at Brew and Brew? Anybody? Okay, so. Two. All right. So, uh, the March meetup, we met over at Brew and Brew over on East 5th Street. They're the bar and coffee shop. Brew and Brew. Get it? Okay. Anyway, um, I, we, we talked with the, the owner of uh, Brew and Brew, uh, Matt Wright, I believe his name is. Uh, he said, hey, we want to open the space up to meetups. So uh, we are, I'm throwing it out there. If you guys are interested in moving there, uh, let me know. Uh, just let me know through the meetup group. Let Ed know, let one of us know. We will not move next month, but if people are in favor of it, then we'll talk about doing it for July. How much okay? space do they have? Uh, they have space, like we can seat everyone here pretty comfortably. I think we had like 40-ish, maybe 45 at that meetup. Yeah. Um, but they've got a lot of space there. They've got like an art gallery over on the side. Let's see you there. So the Wi-Fi is not super great, but they've got lots of space, and it's a bar and a coffee shop. Totally down. Yeah, with that. yeah, they've got yeah. A coffee yeah, they've got that. And so, just just in terms of disclosure, we would have to have pay for a tab of 100 to 150 bucks. Usually, our sponsors hook us up with that, so that wouldn't be a problem. But we might have to count on you to either buy a cup of coffee or buy a beer. Okay. People good with that? Okay, cool. Uh, any last housekeeping? Oh yeah, we do have a few more books. James, I'll let you distribute these. It's called Software Architecture Patterns. I heard you know something about architecture. <laughs> All right, let me double check my notes and make sure I don't have anything All right, else. who wants to learn about Software Architecture Patterns? <laughs> <laughs> All right, give him one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you right there. Yeah. We gotta get you. Got, you're you're guy, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> who else? Who else? <laughs> How many teams do I do? I saw some people walk in as teams. Do is there a project team? There you go. There you go. All right. What else we got? We can, we can share. If they already won something, don't give this to them too. <laughs> Distribute the fun. Yes. Okay, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, uh, thank you. Sorry. It's not my book. No, it's, a, it's an O'Reilly book. Okay. Thank you. Um, there is still beer and soda in the cooler, but feel free to grab one. Uh, we have to be out of this room in like 10 minutes or so, so you don't have to rush out of here. Uh, thank you, everybody. If you parked in the garage downstairs, be sure to stop by the front desk. They'll give you a little park where you only have to pay five bucks. All right? Thank you, everybody. Nice to meet you, man. Next go. Next go, Hall Pass. Yeah, Next go, yeah. Hall Pass. If you need, if you want one and don't get one, just take a picture of it. It's we've got like dozens of them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, find the find the band. Where do you see it? Share yours, because the code's the same one. Oh, uh, yeah, that'd be awesome. Oh, uh, yeah. With ATX Tech Event, I know like, there's lots of meetups that are regular movies. If you wanted an Expo Pass and didn't get one, grab a picture, but, like the URL there. It's not unique. So grab it. Yeah, um, so I mean, I've got contacts with the Hunter and you guys. Let me know. I think of that as kind of a I have an actual 